Hello, and welcome to my series on the CT of Pediatric Emergencies. I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I began my career with an internal medicine residency, followed by three years of work as an emergency room physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In my over 20 years in radiology, I have spent two years in private practice, two years in academics, and 17 years now as a teleradiologist for Virtual Radiologic. I've been their chief medical officer for eight years, and I'm licensed to practice in all 50 states. I have divided our curriculum into general systems and have created three sessions of eight cases each. Session two, pediatric intestinal emergencies. We'll begin this session with a case of gut malrotation. Note here that instead of passing in the normal right to left fashion across the midline, this portion of the duodenum, the third, actually kinks and heads back off in a whirl into the right abdomen. So this is clearly a gut malrotation, and you can see centrally that this is causing occlusion of both the superior mesenteric artery and vein. That'll be more apparent on the cine. Here on the coronal, you can really appreciate the loop of duodenum that wraps around and around those vessels, which are occluded at this critical point. So here we are on the cine. Let's first watch those vessels. There goes the SMV and the SMA, both occluded. Uh, remember the SMV is usually your more sensitive indicator given its low pressure and thin walls. Right here, you see that kinking of the duodenum. See how it just, instead of crossing the midline, it kinked acutely and headed back out into the right abdomen. So we'll watch this through again. First the vessels. There is the superior mesenteric vein and artery occlusions. And now let's follow this duodenum where we'll see it go down the normal second portion, but then right here, it kinks and swirls. So that is a gut mile rotation, and look at all the small bowel dilation, thick-walled small bowel, all consistent with early ischemia. And this patient ultimately did not do well due to a delay in diagnosis. Now again, you can see the occlusion of the superior mesenteric vessels, but this time through, note that loop of duodenum that just loops around and around those occluded vessels. So one more time through, there goes the SMV and the SMA. And there's the loop of duodenum causing all that issue. So that is a case of gut malrotation with ischemic bowel. Our next case is a bowel obstruction due to an inguinal hernia. And this is just a low hanging diagnosis that I'd like to emphasize to everybody. Uh, certainly as an ER doctor, I learned the hard way that in the evaluation of any bowel obstruction, the first thing the attending physician should do is check for a hernia. So here we see extensive small bowel dilation all throughout the abdomen. And here is the telltale finding. There is a loop of bowel descending into the patient's right scrotum. As far as differential possibilities, do keep in mind that a scrotal abscess can have very much this appearance, and you want to establish a contiguity with the intra-abdominal loops of small bowel. So here are the dilated loops of bowel, and here you see that loop passing into the right scrotum. It's a little easier to see that the two are contiguous. Here on the coronal, there are the dilated loops of bowel, and there is the collection of gas in the scrotum, and you can see you can actually identify the bowel passing through the inguinal hernia. So there it is on the coronals. You can see the bowel right there. 
That is an acute small bowel obstruction due to an inguinal hernia, common cause in all age groups. Our next case is of Hinoch Schoenlein purpura. This is a patient, uh, eight years old, I believe, who presented with the classic lower extremity rash. You can see there are multiple segments of hypodense wall thickening throughout the small bowel. Some really impressive thickening of the folds, as you can see here as well. Here is the axial cine. Let you appreciate the spotty distribution of these findings throughout really all of the visualized small bowel loops. Almost everywhere you look, there's a little wall thickening or fold thickening to be seen. Very nice. And we'll look at the coronal. This also helps you appreciate the extent the most involvement there in the central abdomen, but again, you can pick either some wall thickening or fold thickening out uh, throughout most of the course of the small bowel. And so, that is a case of Henoch Schoenling purpura. Our next case is an intussusception. These can be very difficult to make, especially uh, on non-contrast scans and in the infant population uh, where there is very little fat and therefore uh, quite a challenge in identifying specific anatomy. But here we're lucky enough to catch a target telescoped bowel segment right through in the axial plane and there is extensive bowel dilation uh, clearly demonstrating obstruction. Here is that target lesion. Ultimately, nothing beats that. If you can find a target like that, you can pretty comfortably call an intussusception. The problem is it's not always in the perfect orientation to your imaging plane uh, to have exactly that appearance. So we'll look at that one more time. You can see the actual intussusception entering that segment. Here it is on the coronal, and this is much more nicely demonstrated and the dilated bowel as well. And here again, the intussusception, you can see it essentially pinching off right there with the upstream bowel dilation. This is most likely an ileocecal reaching all the way up into the transverse colon. And there is that intussuscepted segment you can see a bit of a target extending distally in the transverse colon, even beyond the annotation. So that is an intussusception of the ileocecal region with significant bowel obstruction. Our next case is a putz jaegers polyposis with intussusceptions. So as we know, intussusceptions frequently have a lead point lesion. You can see multiple telescoped bowel segments, typically with associated polyps, all throughout the abdomen. Here is the largest one with an intussusception and essentially a stalk coated with polyps, as you can see here. So on the cine, note again, multiple loops of telescoping, usually associated with polyps. And here's the big one. You see a big telescoped segment here, coated with polyps on its downstream aspect. There are even a few polyps uh, to be seen on the way out here in the more distal small bowel. So that's a case of putz jaegers polyposis with intussusception. Our next case is a case of cystic fibrosis with an intussusception and a prominent appendix. Uh, appendiceal density and prominence are common findings in cystic fibrosis and they do not necessarily 
indicates acute appendicitis. So here in this patient, we can comfortably diagnose cystic fibrosis based on that extensive pancreatic fatty infiltration that is such a common finding in these patients. In the mid-abdomen, you can see that now familiar target appearance of an intussusception, this one uh, less significantly obstructing than our previous case. But the reason I like this case is this dense distended appendix, again, a common finding in cystic fibrosis and not to be confused with acute appendicitis. Obviously, it stands to reason the viscosity of secretions in these patients' gastrointestinal tracts lead to this issue. So here's the fatty infiltration of the pancreas. And here are the telescoping bowel segment consistent with an intussusception. And note the density and prominence of that appendix. Here again, the fatty replacement of the pancreas. The telescoping intussusception and that dense, prominent appendix with no stranding around it, no free fluid in the abdomen. Here it is on the coronal. There's that intussuscepting segment. And farther back, that elongated, dense, and prominent appendix with no stranding and no free fluid. Here it is on the cine. The intussusception. and the prominent appendix. So that is a patient with cystic fibrosis and an intussusception and a essentially normal for him prominent dense appendix. Our next case is an appendicitis with a perihepatic abscess. This is a common complication of appendicitis and it can be relatively subtle. So here we have enhancing perihepatic fluid that appears to be loculated, uh, may even be subcapsular. Certainly it is distorting the adjacent liver parenchyma. Lower down, you can see the dilated and enhancing thick-walled appendix, which ultimately is the source of all these issues around the liver. So here's the perihepatic fluid with distortion of the adjacent parenchyma. And now we can follow that infectious tract right down to the dilated appendix. This again is a common complication of appendicitis. You'll see these tracts form uh, and the subcapsular hepatic abscess or even subdiaphragmatic abscess uh, forms as a result. Here it is on the coronal. See that perihepatic fluid with enhancement and that slight distortion of the hepatic parenchyma. And you can just appreciate the tract between that and the dilated enhancing and thick-walled appendix. And here it is again, more prominent, that perihepatic fluid collection, and more clearly communicating with the dilated appendix. There is the circular appendix, and we can follow that tract right up to the perihepatic, possibly subcapsular fluid collection. So that is appendicitis with a subcapsular liver abscess. Our last case in this session is a Meckel diverticulum. You can see the blind ending pouch here, and a small focus of intraperitoneal gas. Note also the surrounding fluid density, which clearly indicates the presence of inflammation, if not perforation and leak. The important thing is to identify the origin of this pouch in the terminal ileum. So there it is, and we'll see its blind end there. So it's actually originating uh, at its superior aspect is its base. So here's where it's coming off the small bowel. There's its perforation near its base. And there again, the blind end. So you can see that it's a blind ending pouch originating from the terminal ilium. Here it is here dangling down. 
if it's uh, fundus or blind end inferiorly. And there it is originating there at its base from the terminal ilium. There's that small focus of gas consistent with the perforation. These will frequently have interluminal calcifications, so don't let that throw you. I think the most important thing to know is uh, that this is not appendicitis. So that is a mechal diverticulum with perforation. And that concludes our second session, Pediatric Intestinal Emergencies. Thanks for watching.